is a new film that uh, tells the story of the fastest growing church in the world. It's an underground persecuted Christian movement in a country known, check this out, in a country known for exporting radical Islamic terrorism. People in this uh, country, I'm not going to tell you what country it is, I, I, there's a method to my madness, but people in this country, a, a, a Muslim majority nation, are fleeing Islam in droves as believers bow their knee to Jesus and become aggressively pro-Israel according to this, this documentary. The documentary is a Sheep Among Wolves, uh, Volume 2. Now, what if I told you Islam is dead? One identified uh, church leader says in the film, which was uh, directed by this guy Dalton Thomas and so on, and he says, what if I told you the mosques are empty inside, he continues. What if I told you no one follows Islam inside of this country? W would you believe me? Well, this is exactly what is happening inside of this country. God is moving powerfully inside this place. Now, Iraqi Christian, this is a headline, Iraqi Christian survives being burned alive by ISIS three times. Jesus spoke to me, the, is what it says. And the pastor adds, what if I told you the best evangelist for Jesus was this Islamic leader? The uh, leaders uh, brought the true face of Islam to light and people discovered it was a lie. After 40 years under Islamic law, a utopia according to them, they've had the worst devastation in the 5,000 year history of this country. Thomas calls the movement um, by the name of the country and it's an awakening. It, it owns no property, no buildings, no central leadership, and is predominantly led by women, he said. Now, North Korea propaganda, a video, a de, uh, a propaganda, this video details Christian martyrs, mission from the enemy to build underground church. Named after the Bible verse uh, Matthew, in Matthew 10, 16, which says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, is what the documentary claims. Well, Muslim-backed um, um, Muslim, uh, background uh, people of this country are leading a quiet, a quiet but mass exodus out of Islam and bowing their knees to the Jewish Messiah with kindled affection toward the Jewish people. But the new believers in this uh, Islamic Republic face great risks. Listen to this. It's, it's worth the time that we're spending. Christian persecution close to genocide levels largely ignored due to political correctness. Here's the report. We know that if they get us, the first thing they will do to us as women is rape us. And then they will beat us. And ultimately, they will kill us. One of the believers said, this is the decision we have made that we want to offer our bodies as sacrifices. Because I have this thought when I wake up that when I leave the door, I might not come back. I'm going to leave us there and I'm going to finish when we close. As I look out into our sanctuary and I think of the sacrifice that these people are making for the cause of Christ, 
And we can't get people on a Sunday to spend an hour in worship to the one who is the Savior of the world. We're going to come back to this. You know, we go to church, and and that says uh, we can uh, call ourselves Christians because we go to church. Here's my question this morning. Are you willing to be a disciple and not a convert? That's the question you have to ask yourself. And I want to get into a whole big thing, but I'm talking about being a disciple. It's one thing to just say I'm a Christian. It's another thing uh, to be a disciple. What are you willing to do? Let's go to the text first thing right away this morning. I've got four chapters that we're going to cover in the book of Jeremiah. We're going to cover chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10. So we got a ton of text, all right? And we're going to get into this. And this morning uh, is about being a disciple and not a doer of rituals, okay? It's going to be hard this morning. I I am really fired up about this, so I'm just telling you, uh, the Lord just really convicted me in my time of study as I looked at what was going on in Judah, in Jerusalem, and how God was talking to the people of His nation, His chosen people. And they just ignored him. They just ignored him. This morning is about being a disciple, not a doer of rituals. There are consequences, folks. There are consequences for faking it. You hear the term, hey, fake it till you make it? Yeah, not in this case. Because you're not going to make it when you fake it. The people of Judah believed that they were safe from destruction because the temple, the Lord's dwelling place, was in their midst. Except that God had a different story for them. The Lord has a very different message for Judah. I've got four points this morning that I want to tackle. And our first point is posers not wanted. Okay, we're the boys. Posers? All right, never mind. You know, what is it, wild hogs? Posers? Posers not wanted. Okay, second point this morning. If you want to play, you will have to pay. If you want to play, you will have to pay. Our third point, I told you I would not stand for your disobedience. And our fourth and final point, idolatry. What were you thinking? Those are our four points. Let's take a look. Our first point is going to cover uh, verse 1 of chapter 7 all the way through to verse 3 of chapter 8. And so there's a lot, obviously, a lot of text. I wish we had more time and maybe at another, another juncture we'll come back and really break some things down in, 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 in incredible detail. But this first part is, um, do not trust in deceptive words. In, in verses um, 1 and 2, uh, Jeremiah does what he always does. He wants to make it clear as he is speaking that these are not his words. These are the words of the Lord that have been given to him to bring to the nation of Judah, to the nation of Israel, to the people in Jerusalem. And he says, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, listen to this, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. Listen to what I have to say to each and every one of you. In verses 3 through 8, he says to us, you must amend your ways and trust the Lord. You must amend your ways. Listen, if you would just listen to what I'm saying, 
right? Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds. And what is he going to do? He'll let you dwell in this place. Folks, we live in a time right now, even as I read about this underground church, the fastest growing church in the world, people are dying for the cause of Christ. We are ignoring who God is because we have such great affluence in this country. We have such great freedoms in this country that we think we don't need God. And he is standing before the nation of Israel, Judah, and saying to them, just because my house dwells amidst, uh, amidst you, uh, amongst you, does not mean that you are safe. However, if you would hear me, I'll let you dwell in this place. You must practice, he says, you must practice justice with one and other. You know, for if, in, in verse 5, he says, for if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. So what does he say? I made a covenant with your ancestors, with your father, and your father's father, and your father's father's father. But you're walking away. We in this country are walking away from God. As we watch the persecution of the church, people are willing to die for the cause of Christ. And I can't see a people in our nation excited about going to church for an hour. That God that you say you love loved us so much that He gave Himself for us and we can't worship Him. Worship Him. Watch the movement of the Spirit in your life when you rely upon Him in good times and bad times. Don't worship. He says, listen, do not worship other gods. And you can stay. If you look around within the confines of our nation, why do I keep saying here? Because this is where we live. We, we've got every kind of idol you could possibly imagine. And we're worshiping every single one of them, except the one living God who actually has a way of doing anything. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. He says in... in, in um, in verses 9 through 11, he says, you know, you talk a good game. You, you, you talk a real good game. Right? People have told me a lot in my lifetime. Not only do I have a big mouth. He goes, boy, you, you know, you talk a good game. I'll tell you a quick story. I'm going back almost 30 years. Quick story from 30 years ago. And I can actually remember it, which is a miracle. We're I'm living in Florida. We're gathered to watch Michael Spinks against Mike Tyson. The fastest 90 seconds I've ever seen in my entire life. But I had all these people coming over to the house. And the AC went out. And I call the AC guy. He says, well, you know, and I understand I, I was not a believer then so I shared with him what I thought life was all about and he said boy you talk a good game he thought I talked such a good game that he brought a couple of people with him when he came to the house because he was afraid and when he opened up the door and he saw me he started laughing because he was three times my size he could have squashed, squashed me like a bug 
God is saying to, to Judah, y'all talk a real good game, but there's no substance to what you're saying. We have to remember that if we're going to espouse something, if we're going to speak something, you better be able to back it up. And the only way we could back it up is if we have backup from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. That's it, right? He says, he says to them, you talk a good game, but your actions are different. Because these people, they repeatedly, repeatedly violated the Ten Commandments. And yet called themselves holier than thou. Remember, they're sitting underneath the law. There are 613 laws, 10 of them that we read about in Exodus specifically. They can't even keep 10, let alone the other 613. But you would think, based on the clothes that they wear and the way they walk around and pray in the streets, that they were holier than thou. And God says, I see you. I see you. There's no substance to what you are saying. In verses 12 through 15, listen to this. He says, but go now to my place, which was in Shiloh. And Shiloh is a place of peace. Okay, just so that you know what that is. Where, where I made my name dwell at the first and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of of my people Israel. Remember, Israel has already been slapped. Israel is already out there. He is now fixing to do the same thing to Judah. How many times have you heard in your lifetime didn't you see what I just did to your brother or your sister? How could you possibly do the exact same thing when you know what the results are going to be? Yeah, 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 but you know, the temple dwells in our midst. You're not going to do anything to me. Au contraire, mon frère. It's happening. It is happening, right? So look what I have done. Listen to this. If you skip down to verse 14 in chapter 7, Therefore I will do to the house which is called by my name, in which you trust, and to the place which I gave you and your fathers as I did to Shiloh, I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brothers all the offspring of Ephraim. Look what I've done. Don't you see it? My, my heart during my time of studying for this Sunday was breaking as I look at our nation, I look at the turmoil, I look at the nonsense that is going on, and I said to myself, look at what he has done already. What makes us think that he won't do that to us? What makes us think that he will not put his thumb upon us and wipe us off the face of the earth because he is the God who has created all things and if he has to start it all over again he will start it all over again the temple is not exempt from his wrath and just as I said we are not exempt from his wrath verses 16 through 20 make a very clear or paint a very clear picture he, he flat out says I'm done with them I'm done with them we can listen to politicians all we want to we can listen to naysayers all we want to we, we, we could run around and, 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 and look at how great this nation is but if God says that he is done he's done there is no in-between. Listen to verse 16. As for you, 
Do not pray for this people. He, 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 say, he, says to, he says to Jeremiah, as for you, do not pray for this people and do not lift up cry or prayer for them and do not intercede with me. Why? Because I don't hear you. I don't hear you. If you go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, he says, if my people who are known by my name would just turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. But no, and as he's speaking to Jeremiah, he says, they're not listening. Don't, don't pray for them because I'm not listening to you. I, I'm not interested. He goes on, he says, do you not see what they are, are, are doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? Do you not see what we're doing in the cities in this country and in the streets of our capital and in the major cities in our country? Do you not see what it is that's taking place? God's hand is not going to coddle you anymore. He told Judah, I am not interested in anything that they have to say anymore. And I'm, I'm not looking to scare you into belief, folks. I'm just telling you, if you truly call yourself a Christian, then you must be ready for the consequences of the non-belief that is taking place in our nation and in this world. He goes on and he says, the children gather wood, in verse 18, the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven and they pour out drink offerings to other gods. We serve God every other God except the one who can save us. The one who is the architect. Listen, do they spite me? He says in verse 19, he says, do they spite me? He declares the Lord. He says, it is not themselves they spite to their own shame. Is it not themselves they spite to their own shame? Verse 20 is the kicker in this whole thing in terms of how God is looking at Judah, how God looks at us when we could sit here in, at Sawdust Road in this sanctuary and there are hundreds of thousands of people sitting in their house more concerned about a football game that's going to start at 12 o'clock than worshiping the Savior of the world. In verse 20 he says, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, my anger and my wrath will be poured out on this place, on man and on beast and on the trees of the field and on the fruit of the ground and it will burn and not be quenched. If that doesn't raise the hair on your arms or the back of your neck, I don't know what's going to do it. I just don't know. I'm excited about the Lord coming back. I'm discouraged by the way we worship Him today. And, you know, I was listening to a, a buddy of mine, Jeremy, was uh, preaching uh, this morning, and I was watching a little bit of his early service. Jeremy Wilson was preaching this morning. And he talked about this idea of being a Christian. That's wonderful, right? Oh, you say you're a Christian, you sit back, and you're waiting for the Lord to come. Come take me home. But that's not what we are called to do as Christians. God is speaking to Judah. He says, look, you think just because you walk in and out of that temple, you're okay? Because when I open up the temple and I see what it is that you're actually worshiping in that temple, who forget about it. You know, in my neighborhood, they say, take care, brush your hair. It's over. All right? Brooklyn, where are you? Where'd she go? She went with Alice. Ah, too bad, you know, because uh, if you haven't met Brooklyn, I said, hey, Brooklyn, you know, I'm from Queens. Uh, we're neighbors. Hey. I... In verses 21 through 29, God says, 
and I'm, I'm going to move through this a little bit. Uh, but in verses uh, 20, uh, 21 through 29, he says to them, he says, sacrifice, don't sacrifice. I don't really care. Because your sacrifice is worthless to me. Because it, it is simply a ritual. God doesn't care about ritual. He cares about worship. He cares about your heart. You hear this all the time. I'll talk about it. I'll probably mention it three or four times this morning. But he is not interested in the circumcision of the flesh. He's interested in the circumcision of your heart. All of us could talk a good game. But what's your heart? You see, the flesh is going to go away. The heart, the soul, the inner being of, the, of who you are is what's going to be left. And God knows your intent. How many times do we talk even here amongst us? It's not enough to be able to quote Scripture. God's not interested in your quoting of Scripture. He's interested in the transformation of your heart that causes you to be able to quote Scripture. Sacrifice, don't sacrifice, I, I, I don't care. He says in verse 28, You shall say to them, This is the nation that did not obey the voice of the Lord uh, their God or accept correction, truth, has, <clears throat> excuse me, truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. Cut off your hair and cast it away. Take up lamentation on, 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 the, uh, on the bare heights for the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. See, we, we all want to believe, oh, we're sitting under grace. We're, we're sitting under grace. This is the new covenant. Who, who, cares about, who cares about the Old Testament? Listen, the same God in the Old Testament is the same God that we serve in the New Testament. And if you ever had a parent and you got your parent angry, your parent had consequences that you had to deal with for the actions that you took. You think God the Father is any different? There are consequences. You think that, ah, it's not that big a deal. So what if I, uh, I show up at church once a month? So what if I don't go to church? I don't need to be in a building to be a believer. Well, God says something different. He tells us to communicate with one another. He tells us to fellowship with one another. Why? For the purpose of encouraging one another, admonishing one another, loving one another. That's the importance of corporate worship so that we can gather together and do what? Truly become disciples and not converts. People want to argue, well, Paul was a convert. He talks about being convert. I'm not talking about a superficial or, 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 or Paul is a convert. There are those that say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. That to me is a convert. A disciple is somebody who's walking, talking, believing, and using the word of God to further the kingdom. That's a disciple. Remember when we went through the gospel according to John and we talked about that word disciple. Disciple is a learner. If you're not learning, if you're not devoted, if you don't give all of yourself to him, how could you expect him to give all of himself to you? He wants all of you. He don't want a piece. He doesn't want 10%, 20%, 30%. He wants you. Each and every one of you. Time is ticking. Time is ticking, verses 30 uh, and following through verse 3. Therefore, in verse 32, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be called Topheth. Or the valley of the son of Hinnom. But the valley of, you ready for this? The valley of slaughter. The valley of slaughter, for they will bury in Topheth because there is no other place. The dead bodies of this people will be food for the birds of the sky and for the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. 
And then the Lord says this. Then I will make to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land will become ruin. From a history lesson perspective, during this time, Assyria was this great power. Egypt was a great power. But, but there was this emerging power out of Babylon. And the Babylonians overtook the Assyrians. And they made the Assyrians look like not very good. I had a whole lot of other vernacular I was going to use, but I'll refrain. But they didn't. And the Egyptians had killed one of the kings of Judah. Things were happening. If you look at our own nation, it might not be a bloody civil war, but folks, we're in the midst of a civil war. Do you not realize? It, it is not just a cultural civil war, it is an ideological civil war that is taking place within our country. And the reason that it is happening is because we have forgotten how to serve the one who is the creator of all things. That's why it's happening. Time is ticking. You see, people were putting false idols into the temple. God knows that. And in those days, when you brought sacrifice into the temple, it, it, was a, it, it was to show your worship of God. And he says, I don't need your sacrifice anymore because I know it means absolutely nothing. We have to wake up and remember we are so far beyond this. Let's look at, at, at point number two. If you want to play, you will have to pay. Huggy bear. Just saying. You do, the you, do, you do the crime, you're going to have to do the time. Beretta fans, anybody? I'm just saying. Hi. Hey, Susan's not here. She can't tell me I, I can't, uh, can't do that. Listen, beginning in verse 4 all the way through chapter 9, verse 6 is our second point. They, they have turned, in, in verses 4 through 7 of, of chapter 8, they've turned away and will not return. I'm afraid today in our country, in our people group, that, that people as a whole, okay, are just like that. They've turned away and they don't want to return to God. These people were so wicked. And like them, we continue in our wicked ways. God showed his love and, and yet he's ignored. He's ignored. If we look at verses 8 uh, through 9, I look at that and I, th I start to think we have a pompous way about us, a smugness about us. Uh, as a nation, oh, we're the greatest nation in the world. Those people don't understand. And, and, and I want to say this to you because uh, we, we find today there are probably more missionaries coming into the United States to share the gospel than there are coming, going out. And as a missionary going out, when I started to go as a short-term missionary out into the field, the, the general mindset was that we got to show these people how to do it. I never understood that because when I started going on short-term missionary, I was a new believer. I, I, I wanted to see their, these people's culture. I wanted to understand. But, you know, we've got this smugness about us, this uh, pompous mindset that says we know how to do it you don't know how to do it let me show you how to do it 
It's a big mistake. It's a big mistake. In, in chapter, uh, chapter um, 8, um, verse um, verses 4 through 7, uh, they will not be gathered or buried. Uh, I'm sorry, wrong verse. Um, listen to this. You shall uh, say to them, thus says the Lord, do men fall and not get up again? Does one turn away and not repent? He says, why then has this people, Jerusalem, turned away in continual apostasy? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. And then at the, the very end of verse 7, but my people do not know the ordinance of the Lord. They don't understand. We don't understand. It, it's time for us to open our eyes, literally open our eyes, so that we can see the power of our God. So that we can see what it is that he's calling us to do. And then be obedient to answer that call. Okay, so uh, they, they have turned away and will not return like them. You know, we, we're, we're wallowing in our wicked ways and God has shown his love and yet he is ignored. If we take a look at verses 8 and 9, th there was a smug, as I mentioned, and, and part of that smugness was, was caused by, it's one of the first places that we see uh, the acknowledgement of scribes. And they were, what scribes did was they wrote down the word of God, but they were interpreting. And because they were interpreting, they were interpreting incorrectly. And so there was this whole lie that, that people were living. Does that sound familiar today? <laughs> we're, we're in, in this, if we listen to what everybody else has to say, the bottom line is we end up living a lie. The only truth is the truth that's right here. It is the inerrant word of God. Okay? It is truth. Why? Because he says it's true. He says it'll never waver. It'll never change. It is not subject to anything other than the word that he puts out to every single one of us. In verses 10 through 13, God is not going to stand for disobedience. And we're living in a world today uh, that is exhibiting a great disobedience. Now, verses 14 uh, through uh, 17, listen to this. Okay, because, and it's important, we're in trouble now. <laughs> we're in trouble. He says, because the Lord our God has doomed us and given us poisoned water to drink, for we have sinned against the Lord. Folks, there are consequences for action. There are consequences. And throughout all of this wrath that he is calling onto Jerusalem, onto Judah, through Jeremiah, he still says to them, I love you. I love you. When my dad took his belt off and whooped my behind, in the midst of doing that, he still said, I love you, but there are consequences for the action that you take. Jeremiah, here, here's the thing, from verse 18 all the way to chapter 9, verse 6, Jeremiah weeps. This is where we get in this cluster of verses. This is where we get to know about the weeping, the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. And he says <clears throat> in verses 18 and following, uh, that, you know, basically there's no getting away from the wrath of God. Now listen to this, Jeremiah. My sorrow is beyond healing. My sorrow is beyond healing. My heart is faint within me. He goes on in verse, if you, you scroll down a little bit in verse 20, he says, harvest is past, summer is ended, and we are not saved. That reference, you know, there are two times during the year where they would have harvest. If it didn't rain, there was no harvest. If there was no harvest, the people starved. There was famine. That's where he's at right now. 
He, he believes like this is, there is this in, in incredible famine. Jeremiah is weeping for his people and his nation. He goes on in verse 21. He goes, I mourn. Dismay has taken hold of me. God is upset. We see this at the cross. We see it, uh, he mentions that God in himself is upset. He says it in Ezekiel. He says it in Job. He says it in Psalms. These are places that you could find where God looks at us and he says, I, I'm so disappointed. I, I'm so upset. And yet if my people would turn from their wicked ways and repent, I will hear them. But we must turn from our wicked ways and repent, 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 repent. In verse 1 of chapter 9, Jeremiah says, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. He sees the wrath that is before them and they don't want to hear it. And I think sometimes we turn off ourselves because we want to hear what we want to hear. We want to believe what we want to believe. And it's easier to believe our truth than it is to believe the truth of God. And our truth is not truth. And he takes them through this, this thing. I, I, I won't bore you with a whole lot, but there's a couple of things that I think are important to point out. For all of them are adulterous and assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like their bow. Lies and not truth prevail in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. I feel like God is in heaven today, looking down upon us, who can't fill a church on a Sunday. I had lunch with, uh, many of you know, Dennis Parrish. Um, he is our uh, Southern Baptist Texas Convention representative. And he also passed his church up in uh, 242. We don't need him road. Uh, Baptist Church, right? He says, Lenny, you know, there are 2,700 churches in the Southern Baptist Texas Convention. 2,700. 2,200 are not even running 75 people. 2,200 cannot even put 75 people into their church to hear the word of God, the living God, the savior of the world. And the only reason that we walk and talk on this earth is because of his mercy, because of his grace. It is the only reason that we're here today and we cannot get more than 75 people to fall on their knees on a Sunday and worship the living God. Jeremiah wept. To his nation. He wept. We're in trouble now. There is no getting away from his wrath. Point number three this morning. I'm a little behind, but stay with me. I told you I would not stand for your disobedience. And in chapter 9, verses 7 through 26, he says this. In verses 7 through 9, he says, there will be refining. I'm going to refine, right? In, in, in verse 7, he says, behold, I will, ref I will refine them and assay them. Remember last, last week we talked about the assayer? That is the tester, right? He's going to refine them. He's going he's to do it. He says, their tongue is, deadly, is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceit. With his mouth, one speaks peace to the, his neighbor, but inwardly, he sets an ambush for him. In business, it was the guy who shook your hand and smiled at you while he's st sticking a shiv in your back. That's, that's what I'm talking about. That's what he's talking about. He says, 
the, the, you, you will not even be recognized. He's going to just blow it out. And in verses 12 through 16, do you want to know why I'm so angry with you? Do you want to know why I'm so angry with you? Look at verses 12. Okay, uh, start, actually start in verse 13. The Lord said, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them and have not obeyed my voice nor walked according to it, but have walked after the stubbornness of their heart and after the bowels as their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus says the Lord of the hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them this people with wormwood and give them poisoned water to drink. I will scatter them among the nations whom neither they know their fathers have known uh, ne ne that, I, I apologize, whom neither they nor their fathers have known and I will send the sword after them until I have annihilated them. God is ticked off. Our world today is subject to what we are reading here this morning. And he goes on and he says in verses 17 through 22, the crying over the doom and destruction. Do you know that they, they knew they were so messed up they had professional whalers? People that they called in, women they called in to cry for the nation. That they would weep. They didn't have enough. It was so bad they didn't have enough people, enough women to cry that these women who were professional whalers had to train their daughters. Their daughters turned around and had to train neighbors so that they would have enough people in their midst to cry for the nation of Israel. That's how messed up it was. Professional whalers. Woo! I can't. Nature Boy Ric Flair. Woo! It's crazy. It's crazy the state that they were in. What is mind boggling to me is that today we are trying to rewrite history because we don't like the way it was done. History is the history. It either happened or it didn't happen. Rewriting it doesn't change it. We have a book that shows us the history of obedience. It shows us the history of disobedience. And yet we don't want to hear it. Well, not me. That doesn't, it just doesn't fit into what I'm doing right now. Maybe next time. No. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I hate to do that to you, but I'm sorry. God says in verses 23 through 26 of chapter 9, I want your heart. I want your heart to be circumcised. I don't care about the flesh. I want transformation to take place. My prayer is, you know, we, we live stream this service. And my prayer is that somebody is watching and understands and will be convicted that God wants your heart. He doesn't want you to say, yes, that's, yeah, I'm a Christian. He wants to see evidence of that in your life. And if you don't know Jesus, come on, folks. Today's your day. This is it. Stop worrying, okay? And he finally, in our last point, he says, idolatry. What were you thinking? <laughs> what were you thinking? thinking. He says in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 10, stop listening to false religions of other nations. There's a million religions out there. Some of them even mask themselves as Christian. You're either a believer in Christ or you're not a believer in Christ. You either believe in the Holy Scriptures or you don't. God says specifically, you can't add to or take away. God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. There is nothing else. You can create whatever it is that you want to create. It doesn't change the facts. In verses 6 through 10, he says, here is the anti-idol response. God responds and says, here's the anti-idol. He says, 
This is how you get it, right? There is none like you, O Lord. Admit it. He goes, who, who would fear you? He says, their idol is wood. And goes on and lists all these other things, but I, I just put wood. Their idol is wood. The Lord is the true God, the living God. At his wrath, the earth quakes. Take note. Here's the power of the true God. Verses 11 through 16 Here's the reality. Idols are powerless, folks. Idols are powerless. A portion of Jacob, which is a synonym for Israel. When you see that, you know that he's talking about the nation of Israel. And um, we... Uh, and it's showing that he uh, or, or Israel is a part of him. We need to be praying, folks. We need to be praying. He says that he is the maker of all things. The creator of everything. Scripture validates that. Go to Genesis. It validates what it is that he is saying. And then the, this, this idea of the power of the true God. He goes, um, he is the maker of all things. And then in verses 17 through 22, he says, the exile is before you. He paints that picture. He shows them what is ahead of them and they still don't want to listen. They still don't want to listen. Jeremiah in verses 23 through 25 prays. He prays. And he says he spoke what they should have been praying. We need, we, we here at Sawdust Road, this nation, th th this, this community, we need to be praying. God is in control of everything. Punish with judgment, he prays. He says, punish with judgment, not with anger. I pray that God will punish with judgment and not anger. Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not know you. I told you I would come back to this, this underground church that we talked about. And I know you're going you're gonna to get a kick out of this somehow. But this underground church is in, is in Iran. It is the fastest growing church in the world, and it's in Iran, who is the, which is the country that exports more radical Islamic crazy terrorism than anything else. And, the church, and, and Islam is dying, uh, based on this documentary, is dying within the confines of that nation. A leader of the Iranian underground church explains their goal, listen very carefully, explains that their goal is not planting churches. We hear about the International Mission Board. We hear about missionaries, church planners, right? Oh, I planted 57 churches here and, and 12 churches over here. Here's what they say. This leader said, we're not interested in planting churches, but rather making disciples. The majority of whom in this situation are women. Disciples forsake the world and cling to Jesus till he comes. Converts don't, the leader said. Disciples aren't engaged in a culture war. Converts are. Disciples cherish, obey, and share the word of God. Converts don't. Disciples choose Jesus over anything and everything else. Converts don't. Converts run when the fire comes. Disciples don't. And a pastor explains every day, uh, I'm sorry, a pastor explains everything they do underground are you ready? Everything they do underground is built on prayer. Is built on prayer. That's why at the beginning of our service this morning, I said, take your worship guide, take that perforated sheet, 
fill out your prayer request. Do you understand the power of prayer? We have prayer sheets in the back on that table. How many of you pick that sheet of paper up every Sunday and take it with you so that you can pray for your brothers and your sisters throughout the week? Prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Much. Russ and Jack are going to come up and let me say this to you. I'm revved up. I'm, 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 I'm revved. I'm going to sing. I hope you're ready. I'm, I'm, I am, I am going to sing. And, and it's going to be ugly, but I'm going to sing. Because God says that we make a joyful noise unto God. This underground church in, uh, in, in the Islamic state of Iran, the fastest growing. We must do... Uh, uh, what we must do to cause revival uh, to break out uh, in our country. What must we do? What must we do? God is watching. Idol worship is not going to be tolerated. But I want to say this to you. He loves you and wants you to come to him. He's calling you to draw near. You know, and in my day... I say this for my friend Alvin, who passed away. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord until I die. I will treat everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right until I die. But here's the kicker. Because this is what we really have to believe. I'm going to stay on the battlefield until I die. Every single day. Preaching. Teaching encouraging the mighty word of God. Stand with me, won't you? If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, my folks, my friends, my family, today is your day of salvation. Today is the day the Lord has made. Today is the day. Step out of yourself and don't worry about the physical circumcision. Worry about the circumcision of your heart and be transformed. Let me pray for you. Father, how we love you and bless you and just uh, ask for your continued covering upon us as we try to figure this thing out called life. And it's in your precious name we pray as we continue in our time of reflection.